The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 9167 in the name of Eb Emma Harper on Adopt, Don't Shop. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to contribute to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Emma Harper to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to lead this debate, and I would like to thank my colleagues for supporting the motion and staying in the chamber to contribute this evening. Last year, I led a debate about the cruel trade in puppy trafficking, and in my own region, many hundreds, even thousands of puppies are trafficked illegally every year through the port of Cairn Ryan. The dogs come from puppy farms in Ireland, Northern Ireland, and some from Europe. Both the bitches and the pups are kept in appalling conditions on these farms. And as I described in my speech last year, some intensive breeding sites have up to 500 breeding bitches and thousands of pups at any one time. And since I raised this issue in chamber last year, progress has been made. Just last month, I attended the first ever canine conference on puppy trafficking organized by the Scottish SPCA and hosted by the University of Edinburgh. The Cabinet Secretary also attended to launch the Scottish Government's Commission research, unfortunately confirming that there has been a significant increase in the number of puppies entering the UK in recent years due to consumer demand and changes in legislation that make it easier to transport pets. There is a debate over what is the best approach to tackling the puppy trade, and there is some great work being done in Scotland and across the UK by organisations like the Scottish SPCA, RSPCA, the Kennel Club, Dogs Trust, One Kind, the Blue Cross and Dr Mark Abraham. Campaigners in Stranraer, Eileen Bryant and Raymond Carville and councillors Willie Scobie and Ross Surtees are also focused on tackling puppy smuggling at Cairn Ryan and are also doing very worthwhile and commendable work locally. Many see the banning of third party sales as an important step in the right direction. Dr Mark Abraham is campaigning for the introduction of Lucy's Law at Westminster, which will ban third-party sales outright. The proposed legislation is named after Spaniel Lucy, who was rescued from a puppy farm where she was abused as a breeding bitch for years. Although I am aware that some questions have been raised about the potential effectiveness of the proposed legislation, it is certainly a worthwhile debate to have, perhaps a debate for the future. Today, I will take the opportunity to speak about the importance of choosing to adopt a dog for a from a reputable rescue centre as a way to combat irresponsible breeders and illegal puppy traffickers. While it can be tempting to buy a puppy from a breeder, I would urge everyone to first think about giving a rescue dog a chance. Mm. Right now, we have far too many delightful mm. dogs and cuddly cats living in shelters who need homes and not enough people willing to adopt them. I have three wonderful rescue colleagues myself and can thoroughly recommend adoption as an alternative to buy-in. And according to the Dogs Trust, those who have rehomed a rescue dog will often wish to adopt again after finding the process incredibly worthwhile. There are many advantages to choosing a rescue dog. When visiting a rescue centre, as I did at Canine Rescue Centre at Glen Capel near Dumfries, you will be introduced to a wide variety of dogs of all shapes and sizes, and staff will make every effort to match the right dog to your needs. Canine carers who have spent time with and carefully assessed the dogs will be able to give you a full character profile and help you to make the right decision. The dog you take home will be happy and healthy. Dogs from reputable shelters are, ne are neutered, microchipped, and given a complete health check, including vaccinations and treatment for worms and fleas. Adopting a dog from a recognised dog charity also means that you will have access to expert advice and support throughout the adoption process, even after you have taken your dog home. Of course, there is very legitimate public concern regarding incidents of poor animal welfare in some so-called rescue centres. Many of you will be aware of the appalling case of Ayrshire Ark Shelter, where several dogs and cats were found dead from neglect earlier this year. So I'm pleased to welcome the Scottish Government's plans launched earlier this month to introduce a modern system of registration and licensing for animal sanctuaries and rehoming activities. The proposals will introduce a straightforward licensing system. Ministers are currently consulting on the programme for government commitment and I would urge anyone with an interest in animal welfare to respond to the consultation by March the 4th and help shape these plans. 
Indeed, Dumfries and Galloway Council Trade and Standards have introduced a trusted breeder scheme to help monitor and promote good licensed breeding premises. It is important to stress the gravity of deciding to bring a dog into your family. Dogs are intelligent, social animals with a wide variety of needs that you should be sure you can meet before making that commitment. Christmas is a time, a time of year for synonymous with the impulse buying of cute, fluffy puppies as presents. We have all heard the saying, a dog is for life, not just for Christmas, but not everyone fully understands the meaning behind it. Getting a dog means daily walks, feeding, grooming, training, and the inability to go out for long periods of time, monthly payments for pet insurance, and at times, hefty vets bills. If, after careful consideration, you decide to purchase a dog, it is vital to take the time to investigate whether you're getting it from a reputable breeder. According to the Kennel Club, one in five people who buy a pup admit that they spend no time researching where to buy it at all, compared to less than one in 10, 8% who are prepared to spontaneously decide what shoes to buy. People are more likely to fall victim to scams and puppy farmers if they don't do their research, with almost a quarter of the people surveyed, 22%, saying that they think they went to a puppy farm if they had chosen their pup in 20 minutes or less. The optimal way to avoid contributing to the illegal and cruel trade in dogs is to adopt from a registered shelter or contact the kennel club or your local authority for a list of assured breeders. Presiding officer, I thank everybody again for staying in the chamber tonight and I welcome the debate as follows. Thank you. Okay, we're quite heavily subscribed for this debate, so if people could keep to uh, no more than four minutes, please. Finlay Carson, followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I congratulate Emma Harper on bringing this really important debate to the Chamber tonight. As the Scottish Conservative Unionist spokesman for animal welfare, I've met with many stakeholders throughout the year to discuss concerns on how to develop ways to promote not only stronger animal welfare reg regulation, but heighten awareness of the options people have to reduce, if not eliminate, animal suffering. The laws and sentencing surrounding animal cruelty in Scotland are different to those of other jurisdictions in the United Kingdom. The Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 gives the court the power to disqualify, disqualify a person convicted of cruelty from holding animals for a period as it thinks fit, including life. The maximum penalty under the Act for causing unnecessary suffering to a protected animal is 12 months imprisonment or a fine up of up to £20,000. The maximum penalty for other animal welfare offences is six months imprisonment or a fine up to 5000 In the programme for Government 2017-18, the Scottish Government has outlined plans to introduce a bill to increase the maximum prison sentence for serious abuse cases <coughs> excuse me, to five years. The Scottish Conservatives welcome these plans, but believe the Scottish Government could and should go further. We need to see more preventative measures introduced, such as educating children on animal cruelty. Furthermore, we want the Scottish Government to tackle illegal puppy trafficking, to stop online traders and unlicensed pet shops. There needs to be a robust guideline to accompany the new legislation in order to make people aware of how to spot signs of abuse and the best way to report it. Progress on this has been slow to date, but we will continue to push for more action. The Scottish Conservatives will monitor the progress of the new sentencing plans very closely and continue to hold the Scottish Government to account over animal welfare. However, it's clear that it's not just government alone to, to which, who need to tackle the evils of puppy smuggling and animal cruelty. The work of the Scottish Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Animals, the Dogs Trust and Rescue Dogs Scotland, to name just a few of the charities, or can be partners in the fight against uh, animal cruelty. In my own constituency of Galloway and West Dumfries, the Cairn Ryan Port provides an access point for criminals to illegally traffic dogs into Scotland and the rest of Great Britain. It is vital that we educate the public on illegal puppy trade through awareness of the tactics used by these criminals selling farmed and abused puppies. This educational campaign must breach the geographical hotspots of the puppy trade like Cairn Ryan in the southwest of Scotland. The government should ensure any attempt to tackle illegal puppy trafficking draws on the knowledge from these stakeholders I've mentioned and the RSPCA and whose 
uh, scheme don't adopt, uh, my apologies, who scheme adopt, don't shop campaign has brought us together in the parliament today to discuss this important issue. With many families seeking an additional furry four-legged pal to join them this Christmas, I would urge any potential puppy buyers to consider the following. Does the puppy demonstrate behavioural issues such as fear or aggression? Have you been able to properly visit the puppy's home or meet the mum and dad? Is there evidence that the puppy received vaccinations or warming? Is the seller urging for a fast transaction with no follow-up support? These are the warning signs which you should look out for when purchasing a puppy because these are the sort of things that can be missed through the illegal trade. It wasn't the fines or threat of fines that have made drink driving or smoking in public places unacceptable. It's the peer pressure. It's the peer pressure from your neighbour telling you you're doing the wrong thing. And we need to make sure the public become the guardians for these dogs and puppies by making puppy farms unacceptable in modern life. Finally, presiding officer, if you're concerned about potential puppy smuggling, please report it immediately to the Scottish SPCA on 03000 999 Thank you. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by David Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Emma Harper for bringing this very important subject to the Chamber. The key factors to this issue are the vile, illicit puppy trade and thousands of unwanted dogs looking for a loving home. Presiding officer, I don't think you even need to be a dog lover as I am to be horrified by puppy farms. It is cruelty on an industrial scale. As Emma said, puppies are being smuggled into ports after enduring journeys in horrific conditions. Apart from the psychological trauma, many suffer from severe health issues. On one occasion, the Dogs Trust, who, who I will mention later, took in seven pups covered with infected wounds. Their ears and tails had been docked, apparently using scissors and vodka. It's just one example of what is a sickening industry. Presiding officer, another problem is the demand for trendy puppies, which has created a massive black market. For example, certain breeds such as the French Bulldog sell for nearly £400 in the Czech Republic, but can be sold for more than £1,500 in the UK. Obscene sums of money for what to many owners is a designer accessory. Of course, the breeders are laughing all the way to the bank. That's if they can find one open. Uh, criminal gangs running these operations are understood to be taking in more than £100 million a year. Incredibly, at this time of year, there's a surge in demand for Christmas, which makes this debate very timely. So I'm not going to trot out the cliché, but I think we all know what it is. Presiding officer, I've had the privilege of being a dog owner for most of my life. And as we all know, with their unconditional love and individual personalities, they simply become members of the family. Adopt, don't shop is something that I wholeheartedly support. Although I must confess to being something of a hypocrite here as my Labrador and Retriever were bought from reputable breeders, of which there are many. But next time around, I will adopt, not shop. The Kennel Club fully supports the message that those looking to buy a dog should consider a rescue. And indeed, the Kennel Club breed rescue organisations rehome approximately 24,000 dogs every year. They also share the concerns around puffy trafficking and irresponsible breeding. By adopting a dog, I know that it will be healthy, both physically and mentally, with full veterinary assessments having been carried out. The Dogs Trust, Battersea Dog and Cat Home, who care for 4,000 unwanted dogs every year, the Scottish SPCA, Blue Cross, and many other rescue organisations do fantastic work and should be congratulated for treating animals with the respect they deserve. The link here to puppy abuse is clear. The more people who use rescue centres, the more illegal puppy farms are stripped of demand. Presiding officer, the Adopt Don't Shop slogan is about promoting animal rights. And before I finish, I want to highlight the things that I believe should be stopped immediately if and when we have the power to do so. The appalling widespread abuse of greyhounds in the racing industry, puppy farms, the online sale of animals, and short sentences for those committing vile acts of cruelty. And finally, Politicians who refuse to recognise animals as sentient, sentient beings. Our animals are with us for a very short time and they enrich our lives immeasurably. Let's treat them with respect and fight for their right to live, in a, healthy, to live a healthy life and be in a loving home. Thank you. I call David Stewart to be followed by Willie Coffey. <clears throat> uh, thank you, President Officer, and could I congratulate Emma Harper for securing uh, today's debate and also thank her for all the work that she does on animal welfare. Uh, the Dogs Trust um, was founded in Christmas 
1891. So it's very apt that we're having the debate the day before Parliament breaks for the Christmas uh, recess. And I thought Rona McKay made a, a very good point at the end of her speech when she talked about the crucial aspect about uh, today's debate is that animals are sentient beings. Therefore, we need to be very careful about their welfare. So at the time of year when many families will be thinking about getting a puppy as a present for someone else, it is vital that not only have they considered the responsibilities they're taking on for life, uh, and Emma Harper made that point in her speech, uh, but as the dog's motto suggests, but also looks at the ethics and standards of the person they are purchasing the dog from. And of course, with puppy smuggling on the rise, as well as non-licensed shelters or private traders not helped by internet sales, the welfare and legality of dog sales are a huge issue. Now, there are approximately 8.5 million dogs in the UK, and based on the average lifespan of 12 years, uh, it's requiring around 708 uh, 100,000 puppies are required each year to maintain that figure. Now, the Kennel Club tell us that they register around 220,000 puppies each year, and rescue organisations rehome approximately 65,000 dogs each year, but very few of these are puppies. Therefore, there's a shortfall of around 485,000 dogs each year. Now, Dogs Trust have carried out several investigations into puppy smuggling. And despite the introduction of the pet travel scheme, which allows pet dogs to enter the UK without the need for quarantine, but find they comply with the rules of travel and have a valid pet, pet, pet passport, they've found that puppies continue to be imported illegally into the UK. On top of this, unlicensed breeders in the UK are better able to flourish than in the past, thanks to the internet, where they can readily access a vast customer base. Online sellers are harder to track and trace, but also exist in such high numbers that animal welfare organisations can't keep on top of them all. This is a problem across all forms of pet sales, not only dogs. In partnership with Blue Cross, One Kind and Born Free, I previously, previously raised in Parliament the issue surrounding the sale of exotic animals online. With higher maintenance and welfare needs, as well as many species not suitable as pets, online sales of exotic animals from unregulated traders put many animals at risk of injury at death. And I must finish beside Nosser on some very good bits of advice from Dogs Trust. I think this is particularly useful for anyone who has asked for a dog in their Christmas list uh, for next week. Uh, a number of do's, always see the puppy interacting uh, with its mother and siblings, visit more than once. This is your chance to ask everything about life with the new puppy, uh, take it. Before the puppy comes home, know what paperwork they should have and insist that it's available when you collect. Never agree to be posted later. Walk away if you're suspicious of the seller or breeder and report them immediately to trading standards. Once you've taken the puppy, it's too late. And if the pup was advertised online and you have concerns, report the seller directly to the website where you viewed the advert and take the puppy to your own vet for a health check as soon as possible. And finally, presiding officer, a few don'ts. Don't meet anywhere that isn't the puppy's home. Don't buy from anyone who can supply various breeds on demand. Don't buy puppies that you suspect look too small or underweight for the stated age. Don't feel pressurised to buy the puppy immediately. Walk away if you have concerns. And don't buy puppies you suspect have been imported from the country illegally. So thanks again to Emma Harper. It's an excellent initiative taking this forward. And I strongly support the work she's carrying out. Willie Coffey, followed by Alison Johnson. Thanks, President Officer, and congratulations to my colleague <coughs> Emma Harper for bringing this issue to the attention of the, the Parliament once again. Emma's motion neatly captures the key issues we are facing and correctly draws our attention, and hopefully the public's attention too, to the many rescue centres and shelters in Scotland where there are thousands of dogs and pups all needing loving families and homes today. These centres assess and support the rehoming of all types of breeds and ages of dogs, and people can be assured that adopting a, a dog or a pup from a rescue centre will mean that their dog is healthy and can look forward to a fantastic new life with our new family. From the very helpful background provided to us by Spice, it's clear that we should distinguish between the legitimate and responsible dog breeders who do a great job in producing healthy dogs for loving dog owners and the irresponsible approach taken by some whose only motive is to make a profit at the expense of the welfare of the animals and the exploitation of the public who come into contact with them. There's no established definition of puppy farming, and although they aren't illegal either, some of the practices employed have been described as barbaric, 
using beautiful wee animals as a production line commodity in battery farm settings to be sold on at high prices for a quick buck. Some estimates put the value of the puppy trade itself at around £13 million a, a year. In the Scottish Government's snapshot survey of online puppy sales taken over only a 12-week period showed a variety of individuals selling online, some of it perfectly legitimate, of course, but this gives an indication of the value of the trade. It's probably significantly underestimated too, since the more unscrupulous operators don't exactly wish to appear on the radar too often. I do know of some examples of this happening in East Ayrshire, where mainly by word of mouth it's made known that special breeds of pup are available for sale. A location is notified, usually a car park somewhere, and lo and behold, the boot of the dealer's car opens up and there's a beautiful wee pup waiting for a new owner and a new home. Cash is handed over, often significant sums, and the deal is done. What the new owner doesn't know, of course, is anything about the health and welfare of the pup, its family history and pedigree, and even if it has ever spent any time with its mother after it was born. No papers are handed over to verify anything, and often these wee dogs develop serious health problems, and in some cases don't even survive their first six months. A scandalous situation. The local authorities, presiding officer, are becoming more vigilant about this, but enforcement tends to come about as a result of a response to a situation rather than from a more proactive process or from any kind of spot checking system for monitoring compliance. Perhaps something to think about in there. Uh, so how can we improve things overall? We do have licensing schemes in place and reputable breeders respect the system in which they operate, but how do we tackle the rest? The One Dog paper has a, a number of suggestions, including limiting the numbers and ages of puppies that can be brought in by any one person to the UK under the Pet Travel Scheme, and also requiring the handover of a puppy to take place at the licensed premises and not from the boot of a car. Both helpful suggestions, I think. And the Scottish Government's scoping paper in this talks about mandatory microchipping, both for identification and for traceability, as well as more reliable online sources to provide advice to the public. Probably most important of all is to continue to alert and educate the public about the risks of buying puppies without any knowledge of their history. As we all know, it's usually too late to change your mind when faced with a wee pup staring up at you from the boot of a car. So to the public, please think carefully about before, before doing anything like this, and please consider adoption from our many rescue centres. The dogs and pups there are just as lovely. Congratulations once again to Emma for allowing us to highlight this really important issue tonight. Call Alison Johnson to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too thank Emma Harper for bringing this debate and thank everyone who's been in touch to share their views on the Adopt Don't Shop message and their experiences of life with a rescue dog. It is vital to reinforce the message of ethical treatment of animals during December's frenzied shopping period However, given the lengths that scammers and puppy farmers go to to present a caring image, it's also important not to focus blame on individual choices or imply the motives of anyone who ever browsed online for their ideal pet are necessarily any different than those who already adopt. The underlying message of adopt, don't shop is, of course, that we shouldn't overlook those in need or drive unsustainable demand for something new, not least at this time of year. But the debate on this occasion comes while a focus is on the wider industry supplying that demand. The last meeting of the cross-party group on animal welfare heard from the Dogs Trust about the scale of criminality and abuse within the puppy smuggling trade. And on any given day, around 500 dogs are for sale in Scotland on online classified websites. Demand for designer puppies has led to breeders and dealers illegally importing puppies with no regard for welfare and many examples of truly horrendous neglect. Buyers often have no idea that their puppy has been illegally imported until it is too late. One Kind launched a report last week on Scotland's puppy profiteers, showing that while trafficking and criminality is a hugely important subject, serious problems exist within legal breeding establishments here in Scotland, and the legislation currently in place doesn't offer adequate protection. The briefing sent to MSPs by the Kennel Club details a range of problems people have faced when looking for a dog but unsure how to go about it, they've been susceptible to scams and puppy farmers. Among the statistics are the experiences of people, as we've heard, who've purchased a dog having researched 
if, you know, in any great detail, sometimes for less than 20 minutes. We heard at the cross-party group um, about people taking more time to choose a handbag. And this poorly informed purchase results in almost 15% of puppies bought in this manner experiencing illness, ongoing veterinary treatment, or even death in the first six months, three times higher than those chosen in an hour or more. And I would respectfully suggest that that too is inadequate. With people's intention to share their life with an animal so open to exploitation by disreputable salespeople, keen to luring customers with a tug at their heartstrings, well-publicised guidance on how to find and care for a pet is key to avoiding bad decisions made in haste. And I too thank the Dogs Trust, the Kennel Club, One Kind, the SSPCA and others for the work they're doing to make a difference in this area. I think we have to be clear, this is a multi-million pound industry, frequently operating below the radar, avoiding taxation and regulation. Many people know they're dealing with you know, less than a regulated trade. But once they've seen that puppy, I think sometimes they feel they're rescuing it from a bad situation. So I think we need to stop the demand by going directly to rescue centres. I'm really pleased that the representatives of each party in Holyrood support the message that those looking to buy a dog should consider a rescue first, as the irony we constantly hear from rescue shelters is that they struggle to meet the needs of yesterday's sold puppies and kittens once abandoned, especially after Christmas and often including designer breeds. I believe all parties in this chamber share common concerns about large-scale puppy breeders operating in Scotland, the trafficking of dogs, the largely uncontrolled third-party online traders, and that we share a willingness to work together to address those concerns. But we all want this debate to be much more than a public service announcement. So we need to see the Scottish Government introduce clear guidance for people searching for a dog as to where they can look and who to consult with before making that informed choice and we urgently need to bring legislation up to date to, sc to stop the scams and the puppy farmers. Presiding officer, if we adopt and don't shop, we won't go wrong. That's the right thing to do. Thank you. Christine Graham, followed by Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you. I congratulate Emma Harper on securing this debate and declare an interest as a member of the SSPCA and a patron of Edinburgh Dog and Cat Home, which in 2017 rescued 600 dogs and cats. Uh, the scandal of puppy farming, although I call it uh, puppy factories, has been an issue for a long time. Indeed, I tried to do something about this myself in session one of this parliament with limited success. So I applaud Emma for pressing, Emma Harper for pressing on with the campaign to prevent it and catch unscrupulous dealers. As others have said nowadays, there's also the growing problem of internet sales of pets, including puppies, and the so-called designer dogs coming from sometimes as far as Eastern Europe. All of this flies in the face of animal welfare. Now, we've tried educating the public and advertising campaigns, and it's not been as successful as we would like. That led me to consider, is there another way of approaching this issue? Rather than just looking at the dealers and those who run these factories, is to look at placing a statutory duty on people buying or acquiring a puppy uh, before they can even make the deal. And that's why I'm working on and have now almost completed the draft consultation on a member's bill. Working title, probably won't be the title end, is a puppy contract. Two parts to that bill. One part will be the dealers and the breeders, and some of these dealers will, not be, uh, will be amateurs, uh, third parties. But the other side of the bill will be the person purchasing or acquiring. I use the term acquiring so we can get around the mistakes if money doesn't change hands. And part of what I'm trying to do in that bill has already been mentioned by members. That is to make a, a potential acquirer go through a checklist of whether or not they are the right person at the right time with the right kind of uh, uh, situation to take on any puppy, let alone a specific breed. Things that have already been mentioned, like your suitability in terms of your work and the free time you have, your family composition, your age, the accommodation that you have, 
It will also require them to make inquiry of the person selling or transferring the puppy to them. And so far as practicable to see the puppy with its mother and siblings, all mentioned by other people, but not in law, not a statutory requirement. I, I don't know if it will be successful, but I thought it's worth a try rather than just constantly trying to educate the public with the various advertising campaigns and debates. The duties on breeders would also be extended to really check out the person trying to uh, acquire a puppy from them. You see, it's trying to cut off the demand. If we can cut off the demand, which is in Scotland, in Scots law, we then reduce, it follows, supply from one source and another. It's early days, but like Emma, I'm determined to do as much as possible to reduce animal suffering and to identify the criminals who make big bucks and here there is a role for HMRC from that ruthless trade. We should also give a thought to Brexit and the impact of EU withdrawal on animal welfare rules and regulations. And I'll conclude by saying I do not have a lifestyle for a dog, much though I'd love to have a dandy din mint, look it up if you don't know what it is. But I have a rescue animal, it's a rescue cat. We get on fine, his name is Mr. Smokey, and one day I may be in a position to have a rescue dog. Thank you. Maurice Corey to be followed by Colin Smith. Thank you, Deputy Signing Officer. I firstly begin by congratulating Emma Harper on securing today's debate, and well done to her to do so. Um, it was good to see that the two puppies which visited us last year in the Parliament are now doing so well and are happily in their forever homes. That sort of good story is a credit to the Scottish SPCA and is one, only one example of the great work that they do. And I'm glad to see Emma Harper's motion highlights them as an example of the type of organization which people should be using to, to get a dog. Dogs are a man's best friend. I know Bobby, my, West, my family's West Highland Terrier is certainly to me. It's a corny overused phrase, but it's still very true. They fulfill a number of vital functions in our society and they can be a child's loyal first best friend, companions to the elderly, carers for those who are blind or deaf, and sometimes even our work colleagues, whether in the police or the armed forces. And also, especially recently I've been reading, that trained dogs are now being used by the armed forces veterans in America who are suffering from PTSD. And it's something that I think we should look at in this country uh, as we speak. The American author and animal activist Roger A. Carris summed up our relationships with dogs when he wrote, dogs have given us their absolute all. We are the center of their universe. We are the focus of their love and faith and trust. They serve us in return for scraps. It is without a doubt the best deal man has ever made. So it is only right that we look after our best friends properly. And as the motion notes, there are currently thousands of dogs situated in rescue centers across Scotland, and these should be the priority for those looking to give a dog a home. I also welcome the inclusion on online, online trade in the motion. And I had a quick look, search online myself and was able to find numerous websites to buy dogs where through official looking website or websites like Gumtree, most sites didn't even have the information on the dog's past care and status, which you would hope you'd be able to find out. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd urge anyone looking to get a dog not to use these sites, but to use one of the proper rescue centres. And one of those nine SPA, SPCA rescue centres in Scotland is based in my West Scotland region in Dumbarton. And I know of several examples over the recent years of successful homings for dogs, which has brought a lot of joy and love to families. Thank you. I forgot about my microphone. <laughs> Colin Smith, followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to Emma Harper for her motion, which has allowed uh, this debate to take place. With thousands of dogs across Scotland needing rehome, today's debate is a great chance to talk about the benefits of adopting dogs and the importance of putting a stop to unethical dog breeding. The recent Dogs Trust report into puppy smuggling revealed the sheer scale of illegal puppy trading, particularly from Central and Eastern Europe. An investigation found that puppies were being bred in poor conditions and imported into the UK in, and I quote, long journeys in cramped, filthy conditions with little or no food or water. They found evidence that those involved in the business are finding new ways to avoid detection, including falsifying data on pet passports, importing puppies at an older age and transporting them in smaller numbers. An investigation even found one vet willing to sell them sedatives for the puppies as sedated dogs are considered to be easier to smuggle into the country. 
As the motion notes, some of this trafficking is taking place at Cairn Ryan Port and my home region of Dumfries and Galloway. Following the deeply disturbing findings of the, the BBC Scotland documentary, The Dog Factory, which revealed that animals were being illegally transported through this port, a pilot was set up to help tackle the problem. As a councillor, I had the privilege of chairing the Council's Environment Committee when this multi-agency operation was established involving the Council, Police Scotland, HMRC, Stena Line and the Scottish, Royal, Ulster, Irish and Dublin SPCAs. It was a clear example of the benefits of a collaborative approach to this issue and since the scheme began it has successfully recovered and rehomed more than 170 puppies and I'm delighted that in September it was extended for another year. Most valuable and innovative work such as this is taking place at a local level, there remains a clear need to address the more fundamental inadequacies of the existing legislation. As well as the need to introduce a fit person check, there's a, there is a, a more general call for the development of new up-to-date offences that take into account large-scale puppy farming, online trading and designer breeding. The operations at Cairn Ryan have highlighted the benefits of intelligence sharing and we should be looking at how to expand this practice. Trading Standards Scotland are currently running an operation to gather intelligence on puppy sellers and this raises the possibility of using consumer protection legislation to take action against puppy sellers in cases where they can be identified. Additionally, we must do more to put a stop to backstreet breeding here in the UK. Research by Battersea Dogs and Cats Home found that only 12% of the puppies born in Great Britain are born to licensed breeders. The report into licensing dog breeding in Great Britain highlights the need for regulation that both encourages dog breeding, breeding businesses into the licensed market while also providing sufficient safeguards for dogs and consumers. The Welsh Government have brought forward stricter welfare criteria for dog breeding and I hope the Scottish Government will follow soon. Beyond tackling the specific issues of puppy smuggling and backstreet breeding, we must also do more to protect dogs against cruelty and mistreatment. The recent decision to lift the ban on tail docking was, in my view, a deeply regrettable move and I hope in future we will see this reversed. I was, however, pleased to see the Scottish Government committing the programme for government to raising the maximum sentence for animal cruelty to five years, which is very welcome. And now that the UK Government have published draft legislation to take this matter forward in other parts of the UK, I hope that when summing up, the Cabinet Secretary will be able to share when the Scottish Government will bring forward legislation to bring about this change in Scotland, in line with the Battersea Dogs and Cats Home campaign for tougher sentences. Our current maximum sentence of 12 months is one of the most lenient in Europe and completely fails to reflect the seriousness of these crimes. I'd also urge the Scottish Government to take bolder action on electric shock collars. Shock collars are fundamentally cruel and unnecessary. Regulating their use will not put a stop to this mistreatment of dogs and the creation of a qualification for using them risks making their use aspirational. The care, case for a full ban is clear and has the support of a wide range of animal welfare organisations and dog training and behavioural experts. We must also do more to ensure that dogs are bred, sold and looked after in a more ethical way. However, shelters and rescue centres across Scotland are doing some fantastic work to find dog suitable homes. So I will end by joining with other members and encouraging people to adopt a dog rather than buy one. Thank you. I have two more speakers and then the, the Minister's response. So due to that, um, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate to allow this to happen. Uh, can I invite Emma Harper to move motion without notice? Yep, moved. The question is that the debate be extended uh, by no more than 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? agreed. That is agreed. And I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, President Officer. I want to not only thank Emma Harper for bringing this debate to Parliament today, but also for her tireless work on raising awareness around puppy trafficking, illegal puppy farming and dog welfare. Last year, in the debate that she brought then, I talked about my friend's wonderful dog, Dita, a giant schnauzer, who was a maltreated breeding bitch, a casualty of the insatiable demand for ped pedigree puppies. And she was rescued by my pal and she was lucky to live out the rest of her life surrounded by love. But this year, my speech does not have such a happy ending because last month, the biggest illegal puppy farm in the country was discovered in Fivey in my constituency. And yet again, we see that the love that we have as a nation for our dogs is manipulated for commercial gain at the expense of the health and welfare of those dogs. In June this year, I wrote to Aberdeenshire Council out of concern raised in the local press 
that Michelle Wood of Fivey had applied for planning permission for kennels. Miss Wood was linked to the James family, three members of which had previously been banned from running a pet shop and owning more than two dogs after animals in their care were seized from horrific conditions. The press suspected that Miss Wood was a front for the James family, who had readily unsuccessfully uh, applied several times uh, for licenses via other family members. And thankfully, the for Martin Area Committee joined the dots and refused the license and planning permission. But last month, the SSPCA and Police Scotland raided premises in the Fivey area and seized 105 animals. This included over 90 bitches and their pups who were bred illegally and kept in horrifying conditions. Investigations are ongoing, so I can't say any more except this. Many of the animals seized were in such poor condition that they have had to be put to sleep. Extensively and aggressively bred bitches do not produce healthy babies. And if you buy a puppy from someone you do not know, or you have no trusted recommendation from, you not only run the risk of having a very sick animal in your hands, one who heartbreakingly a vet may recommend that you put it down, you also unwittingly purchase, uh, perpetuate the illegal trade. The people who illegally breed these dogs know our vulnerabilities. They know that it's very difficult for a customer to walk away from a puppy, even if they have doubts about how they're being cared for. Illegal puppy farms like the one in my constituency prey on our love of dogs. But if you truly love dogs, you'll home a dog responsibly. Adopt an older dog if you can. And if you must get a puppy, don't buy one on impulse. Do your homework and let's end this disgraceful and cruel trade. The last of the open debate speakers is Matt Ruskell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, join other members in thanking Emma Harper for bringing forward uh, this debate tonight? I'll also declare an interest as an honorary member of the British Veterinary Association, and I'll declare an interest as the owner of a retired greyhound called Bert, uh, who is also the winner of the Hollywood Dog of the Year public vote this year. And, Presiding Officer, he greatly enjoyed uh, his day inside the Parliament. Uh, he ran up and down corridors. He even broke into Willie Rennie's office at one point. Um, he didn't leave him any messages, but uh, he had a, he had a he, well, not about fairies anyway. But he, he had a, he had a great time. And I'd like to pay tribute to the Scottish Greyhound Sanctuary, which is the organisation that rehomed um, Bert with us. They take dogs uh, often in have come from quite disgraceful conditions in, in the racing industry. And they foster them, they bring them into a, a, a real home where the dogs can get used to being in a, in a, in a loving um, environment with a real family. And they then take these dogs um, and work with potential owners. They home check uh, the potential owners' homes to make sure that they're suitable for the dogs. And they then work with the dogs right the way through the adoption process uh, with their new families and their forever homes. Um, and there is a bit of a misconception about greyhounds because people think they need to be uh, walked lots. They, they don't. Um, two short walks uh, a day is usually, usually uh, suffice. Uh, they don't need a huge amount of exercise. And they're not highly strong. They're very chilled out, very relaxed dogs. So they're, they're great family pets. But there's, a, there's a, a serious point here because we, we do need to look, I believe, at regulating the industry further because hundreds of uh, greyhounds are killed each year, often simply because they've gone lame and they can't race anymore. Um, greyhounds are often shot in the head with a bolt gun. Um, some greyhounds are sold to China, where they race at a greyhound track called the Canidrome, where uh, unless the dog places first, second, or third in its first uh, five races, the dog is uh, otherwise destroyed. So, you know, there's a serious issue here about an industry which is making a lot of money, a betting industry which is making a lot of money from the exploitation of animals. And I believe we need to look again at regulating the greyhound industry. And certainly compulsory rehoming should be, at the very least, uh, a significant reform. So I back Emma Harper's call here that we should adopt, uh, not shop. And we should also look, where appropriate, at adopting greyhounds. Thank you. 
I now call Rosanna Cunningham to respond to this debate for around seven minutes. Please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I congratulate uh, Emma Harper, as so many members in the Chamber already have, for uh, calling this debate uh, shortly after the publication of the research commissioned by the Scottish Government from the Universities of Northumbria and South Wales uh, to help the understanding of the policy challenges relating to the illegal trade and irresponsible breeding of puppies. It is important that we uh, do this kind of research to make sure that uh, as we move forward on policy issues that the underpinnings for that uh, movement are strong. I'd also like to thank everyone else who, who contributed to this debate. There were a, a number of speakers and I think it's fair to say that many of them were echoing each other's uh, sentiments and comments as one would imagine uh, in a debate such as this. I'm not going to try and recall the names of all the dogs and puppies that were referenced in the debate. Uh, I see that that uh, is something that uh, uh, most members care very much about. Sadly, uh, I'm one of those people who have to make a choice because of uh, my work uh, life balance that having a puppy or a dog would not be appropriate in the current circumstances. And I do wish that other people would themselves understand that there are times when one shouldn't have a dog of any kind, because if you can't look after a dog, then it is not fair on the dog uh, to, to, to take one on. Emma, of course, Emma Harper, of course, um, uh, 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 opened the debate, and I do recognise her long-standing and steadfast concern about this issue. Um, she flagged up the research, uh, and I think she very uh, um, reasonably reinforced that adopting a rescue dog is by far the best way to acquire a dog in the first place, as did many other members. Um, I, I just want to say that both Rona Mackay and David Stewart, I think, referred to cross-border trade issues, um, not so much about the illegal puppy trafficking that uh, we're thinking about here, but the, the, the desire of people uh, to, to sometimes, uh, I think, adopt dogs that they think are being abused in other countries. Now, that overlooks the fact that there are huge numbers of dogs here uh, that need to be uh, rehomed, uh, but also, sadly, um, uh, through a kind of misplaced sense of care, uh, are simply encouraging uh, uh, pet movements, uh, encouraging uh, illegal trafficking. And they're doing it from the best of intentions, but it is a case where intentions, unfortunately, result in completely the opposite to what they probably want to see happen uh, in the first place. Um, the illegal puppy trade is uh, indeed a blight across the whole of Scotland, and uh, I listened with interest to Gillian Martin's uh, description of what has happened in her own local area. Um, the fact remains that Cairn Ryan is a main entry port for, uh, uh, for many, many unfortunate puppies. Uh, my uh, officials regularly attend uh, meetings there. Um, they keep me informed uh, as to what is happening locally. And I think the cooperation and intelligence sharing between the enforcement authorities and welfare organisations across the UK in campaigns such as Operation Delphin um, greatly, is greatly encouraging. I'm also pleased to see that HMRC are now taking a very close interest in recovering large sums and unpaid taxes from the criminals involved in this lucrative cash-based trade. Sometimes ways to tackle it aren't immediately obvious. Um, uh, so I think that's a very welcome uh, step. But the puppy trade, of course, is driven by buyer demand. There's a great deal of information already available to those wishing to buy a puppy responsibly. So we would really like to ensure that everyone thinking of buying a puppy or any pet not just a puppy, has no difficulty in finding advice if they look for it. Our code, our code of practice for the welfare of dogs advises potential purchasers on all the aspects to consider when obtaining a puppy and how to purchase it from a reputable source. And indeed, as I indicated at the outset, whether one should actually take on a dog at all. It also, yes, of course. Christine Graham. Cabinet Secretary, I, I certainly don't want to corner you, but um, are you sympathetic to my proposal? Um, I am trying to corner you. Sympathetic to my proposal that we embed in statute these duties on the person acquiring, uh, rather than just having guidance worthy though it is. I Rosanna think I would be, uh, uh, want to look very carefully at all proposals, but I think we all recognise that the member is indeed at it, um, uh, as we have already had a meeting uh, on this very subject. <laughs> Uh, but congratulations to the member <laughs> for 
chancing her arm as she is uh, often wont to do in circumstances like this. Um, but of course, uh, all uh, proposals that are practicable and manageable uh, will be looked at very carefully. But sadly, as a number of members have said, codes of practice can only go so far. Um, the research we funded um, confirmed that many buyers act on impulse without seeking information beforehand and will still agree to take delivery of an animal in exchange for cash in the most unlikely places, perhaps wrongly believing that there is such a thing as a cut price pup. Um, and it's something that we need to eradicate from people's thinking. By doing this, they unwittingly at best provide a market that can be exploited by puppy traffickers. And there's also a tendency for well-meaning buyers to want to rescue puppies that may be sick or are from dubious sellers. But that just continues to fuel the trade. If you want to rescue a pup, there are plenty of reputable establishments and they should be the first port of call for anyone who wants to take on a rescue dog. In keeping with the commitment in the programme for government work on a public awareness campaign in conjunction with the SSPCA and other leading welfare organisations is already underway. But sadly, events in the past year have also shown that not all of those looking after rescued animals do so with the best interests of the animals at heart. And that is why we committed to consult on a modern system of licensing and registration for animal sanctuaries and rehoming activities. This will ensure that effective controls are in place to further protect the welfare of rescued animals. And the consultation paper uh, launched on 11th December, so I would call on all those with an interest in the subject to make their views known. We should not be under any illusions. The demand for particular breeds and movements of dogs between Northern Ireland and Scotland will not be easy to disrupt. There are no animal health restrictions on the free movement of pet animals between these two parts of the UK, just as there are no restrictions on movements of dogs to Scotland from England and Wales, uh, although poor welfare conditions can, of course, be dealt with. Now, that sounds gloomier than I hope the position actually is uh, or will uh, become. Um, we will continue to work closely <coughs> with the Pet Animal Advertising Group, support their efforts in this area, which do have some effect. Um, uh, however, the key message remains that the illegal trade in puppies from Ireland and elsewhere could be seriously disrupted if every puppy buyer first considered rehoming an animal from a centre in Scotland, or if they must buy a puppy, <coughs> insist that they always see it first with its mother at the breeder's premises. So finally, I hope that in time, the message adopt, don't shop, will become as well known as the advice that a dog is for life, not just for Christmas. That concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.